I'm a musician. Uh, it's it's hard to believe because it's been years since I've released an album. Uh, my confidence in my work has been shot pretty much ever since starting to transition, and I have no formal training. It's um, it's hard to be able to look at yourself, your habits, your character, your tendencies, flaws, and really like see yourself in your work. I think like. Like back in my musical heyday, I worked on my very unclear, clumsy emotions around things bothering me. They were vague, very like bright eyes, rough. I I was a raw nerve as a musician, and it paired well with my relative like lack of insight around why I'm so sad all the time. I had a very particular command around my language, like raw enough to evoke a general sense of something without being so particular as to be um, incriminating, I suppose. It left me coy, in a sense, around, around the things, the kinds of things I wanted to write about. Being a closeted furry, uh, feeling like I was born in an extremely wrong boy, the kind of desperate attraction I held for people that only terrified me the moment the potential reality of actually being seen or worse, held by them set hold. That's a fun story for uh, another time, or maybe never. Um, it's hard now. I'm, I'm too acutely aware of what's ailing me, too aware of my voice, both the physical and lyrical, to find any confidence, any foothold in making music again. I've written lyrics, I've, like, brainstormed some things on the keyboard, sure, but, like, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm too conscious of the people around me hearing me stumble my way through trying to be either so nakedly specific in my English that it's, uh, that it's, that it's not good, or like uh, trying to write like I did a, a decade ago, you know, pretending just really hard to not know myself. It's, it's great. I was probably going to be content to never make an album again and just, you know, sunset this part of myself forever before I kind of broke my mind over The Flowers of Robert Maplethorpe, the album by one Patricia Taxon, who I am... I hate to admit, uh, kind of an embarrassing fan of. I think she's a phenomenal musician and like a really good thinker. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll cut this bit probably. The, the point is that I can't get us to that album right away, though it is the beginning of my story here. Like I, I wouldn't be making this essay if not for that album. So like, let's just let's just put a pin in that for now and let's pivot here. Um, why do songs do lyrics? No, wait, that's terrible. Okay. Look, there's a moment in Sapphire Apartments. Uh, apartments, right? Like, like my brain tells me to say, like, apt, but, but, that, but that's not it. Whatever. Where on track five, Kanban, this, like, this little phrase happens. I told you nothing mattered. You said you never cared. I let you kiss me after we drove off anywhere. And that... Okay, on the face of it, it's like a pretty clear emotional phrase, right? Like, Taxon's voice is very exposed, like, emotionally. It shakes a little. It has the kind of, like, I don't I don't know music theory or the right term for it, but it has the kind of tension you get from trying to push through some kind of, like, heavy emotion that's compromising your voice. Or, you know, it's an affectation on her part, but even then, you know, she nailed it, so, like, good job. And that's fine. I, I think if I listen to this album by itself, I'd honestly not dwell on it like I do. Like, Sapphire Apps is a pretty breezy and fun album. There's a few tracks on it that feel like dreamy pop classics. It's, it's, it's great, but that phrase is stuck to me because that melody exists in another one of her albums, doesn't it? This is Nine Stars, off the album Picks and Bit. Um, our story also isn't going to land here just yet. Uh, God, this essay is a bit of a mess, I'm sorry. But uh, th this melody, popping back into my ears from one to the other, took me entirely by surprise. See, I've on and off listened to text and stuff for a while. Like, never too actively. I'm, um, I'm developing an ear for music without lyrics, let's, let's say. 
See, one of the curses of my self-taught education is that most of the music I listened to growing up overwhelmingly favored lyrics to be the weight of the piece, like Decemberists, Bright Eyes, Amanda Palmer, Owen Pallad, uh, sort of. It's kind of a trip and a half, and even in my more recent tastes with like, you know, Mitski and Hop Along, really like letting you sit in their emotional states while their words kind of take you places. It's, it's, all, it's all good, but it's clearly left me with a bias. That, that being said, I was pretty excited initially to listen to The Flowers of Robert Maplethorpe's See, um, hmm. By the time I release this video, I'll have built up the courage to come out as maybe a furry, actually. Um, you know, uh, sure. You know, let's pause this entire video so I can pose this question. Um, if my identity at this point is like tied to, uh, cat girls, like, like so, uh, specifically because I've kind of written a narrative about the sort of like half in, half out kind of thing and how it reflects my own feeling as like a non-binary, a, a trans person who can like, I don't know, don a facade, hide my ears and tails, so to speak, and seem completely normal. You know, a forever visitor of a life that I could have had instead. I don't know, does, does, does all that make me a furry? Uh, tell me in the comments. Anyway. This album was very hyped up as like a, a big definitive moment for Taxon, putting her for her identity like front and center. And I was, I, I was curious. I mean, it's not often you, you meet someone in in the know out in the wilds of the internet. So like, this could be really huge. And then, I think it was by the time I got to La Lettre that I kind of panicked and exited out of the premiere of the album. I, I worried at the time that I was either going to, you know, panic because this is going to get too real or maybe I'd feed some kind of vicious part of myself, and, and I didn't I didn't want to think those thoughts at the time. I threw up my hands and went, oh, it's, it's probably great, I should get to it later, and I didn't for a while. It took a close friend of mine telling me out of the blue that he stumbled upon it, and it was this like foundational piece of music for him that convinced me to push through in it, and, um, and I, think, uh, I think it convinced me to give up on being a lawyer. See, Part of why this essay is such a mess is that I'm very, very worried about talking about music online because the world of music theory is a vast place with a lot of like really cool insight to be had. And that's all great. But like the thing it mostly does to me, at, at least right now, is make me feel uh, painfully aware of my own relative inexperience. Um, I don't want to do any of this work a disservice. And it's hard to shake the feeling that I kind of can't help but do that because I lack a good education on the topic, but I, I still feel what I feel, right? Like, I may not be able to really articulate this clearly or, or get the technical elements at play to create these feelings, but like the album imparted a sort of deep-seated panic about me that, that I was fooling myself into thinking I could punish myself into having this career that could materially help people at the cost of my spirit and my passions, that, that trying my hardest to be the kind of person that my family thought I was going to be, that, that my professors expected me to be, was never going to happen. That there was something hidden in my head that couldn't put the pieces together. So obviously from there I decided, solemnly I guess, to listen to all of her albums as they came out, and so far that's been pretty good. You know, Gloria's like raw good music feel um i actually low-key really like aeroplane it's really charming um i'm still chewing through visiting narcissa though like all cards on the table i'm still unlearning my like lyrics only stuff so it feels very like in a foreign language there's moments where it really hits home and look i'm working on it anyway this also made me look back a little so i got like pretty seamlessly into her Très de Chez Ballet trilogy sort of Gelb was really easy to get into, and Rosa has like a middle section that can be a bit abrasive when I have a headache going, and Schwartz has like a couple moments when my like misophonia goes like really haywire and came across uh, Picks and Fit, kind of remembering really liking cilantro, and it doesn't frankly, and going in for a full listen. And that's when Nine Stars hit. Um, it's, it's hard to explain the kind of stress this moment put me under because I've been grappling a lot with my mental health. You know, depression, anxiety, sure, but it was this law school nightmare that really started to get to me because after some talks with a close friend of mine, um, he left to kind of worry 
in me, that things were not coming easily to me. A basic chores, studying, working reliably on assignments. I had focus issues that I'd long been attributing to laziness or some kind of, I, I don't know, profound moral defect. And after an encounter with my then psychiatrist who concluded that my graduating undergrad kind of showed that I can't have ADHD, it sort of made me realize that it was just it was just going to be something I could never really address. But then, but then it got weirder. Like things that are said in this song in particular, and kind of in this album as a whole, caused a panic, if you could believe it. It caused me to reflect on the way I negotiate conversations, the kind of reflexive patterns I have, the worry that, like, left to my own devices, I just will cross conversational boundaries without ever noticing. There's a lot to unpack here, and the way that the healthcare in this country is heading, the answer to these questions about my brain, it's probably just gonna end up being, uh, who cares? You know, if, if I'm good enough to keep working, I should just shut up and make capital. I got off topic again. I wanted to talk about Picks and Bit and the flowers of Robert Maplethorpe, but before I kick this off, I actually need to circle back around to Gloria, specifically because after it came out, Patricia Taxon tweeted that sometimes she just writes lyrics that fit the meter or the rhythm that she requires for the song, setting the song Blunderbuss off that album as an example. This one tweet uh, put a huge wrench in my system here, uh, sort of. I mean, I'm not so naive or like that kind of music critic that I'm like out here pouring over lyrics to try to understand the song. I know there's more to it than that, but it made me question my relationship to some of these tracks in particular. Was what I was feeling the intent of the author? Oh God, are we doing the death of the author on this channel? Oh God, okay. Look, uh, let's start with The Flowers of Robert Maplethorpe. That's an album that's pretty text heavy in my humble opinion. It was pretty good for this because it's also pretty explicitly a narrative. Maybe it's not one that's told, like, comfortably directly. Like, part of the charm of this album is that Taxon refuses to shy away from this part of herself. Like, we're talking paws, fur, pets. It's it's an unflinchingly sexual, darkly intimate, inexorably furry album, and it is fantastic because of it. There is a raw beauty expressed here in, a, in the depths of heartbreaking pain. I don't know what you It is, weirdly, the kind of power I've been wishing to find again in my own work. What this album means to say, it says with almost every tool in her arsenal. Mechanically precise, her voice here processed, chopped up, repackaged, sampled, and in pivotal moments exposed, raw, deeply confessional. Sorry I'm like this. Sorry I ever came. wish I could love you for you, but it might be too late. It's the kind of pain that I felt uh, maybe the first time I really sank into the album Get Disowned by Hopalong, the kind of open wound you've been invited to live with, to feel reflected into your own. It's hard to not reveal some things about yourself in talking about this album because it kind of does that to you. At least when I listened to it, it made me think of my relationships. I, I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to explain what my life is. I don't I don't date. Um, I don't seek physical intimacy. The, the idea of it, be it a result of dysphoria, trauma, whatever, is deeply terrifying. But I'm close to people. I, I form really close friendships. The breaking of which can be devastating. One such event actually caused me to go to law school in the first place. Um, out of some sort of a feeling of penance, I want to say. Like the idea that I needed to do something with my life because I failed people that I was close to. It just, it just hurt to reflect on that. To worry that I've somehow done the same to more friends. That, that I can only hurt people. And at the same time, listening to this album was infectious, liberating, that, that, that I could care for people, people I might never meet in person, that, that only talk to me through our writing to each other, to, to know me maybe even truly as just the persona I adopted on that particular site. 
there was something exhilarating to it, like leaping out of a plane, like falling joyously to an unknown world that could devour you and maybe wanting that. I felt so weak, so disgusting as I wept upon his knees. I could sense the old contempt I had assumed that this wolf would feel. But oh, there came his paws. The wolf took hold and carried me away. This was, to be clear, the groundwork in my relationship with this music. The feeling that there was a clarity of thought that ebbed and flowed with the other components in the song. And this culminated in me finally taking the plunge and listening to Picks and Bit. I am going to level with you all. I kind of did a similar thing with Picks and Bit that I did with Flowers. Like there was a level of, um, how do I say this? There was a kind of bold, exuberant joy to the first half of the album that made me kind of bounce off it when I first landed. Maybe I was just particularly depressed at the time. I mean, probably, or like otherwise kind of just not really in it to get into the albums like I want to say very Sega Genesis, like hyperactive noise thing it had going on. Um, plunging into it again, the Telltale tweet really hit home for me where I can kind of see definitively in a track like Cilantro. What's that sound? Slam! The door's gone down like a billowing storm drain swallowing grounds. There's not a soul here. Telegraph beer, delicate tears that are horrific on the unwashed beers. Like... Like, the joy of phrases like this isn't in trying to pick apart a direct narrative as much as it feels good to hear those words happening in conjunction with that song, which was in itself a bit of a mind-bending experience for me, who spent, like, all of high school and undergrad listening to Connor Oberst to tell me really bluntly how I felt about everything in no uncertain terms. I, I could get into this, and th that was kind of a cool thing for me, you know? It didn't have the kind of heavy presence Flowers does, but like, that's fine. Again, you know, I like the Ballet Trilogy, Sapphire Apps, Gloria, it's, it's all pretty good. It's, it's all pretty good. I was like, I was like completely blindsided by this song. I've already told you this, but it's worth noting that even within the song itself, I was blindsided. Like it starts like this. My stars fly down when you're around, or perhaps the sight of you starts the trick and all the sound. The glistening, bristling light is beaming over the sea, but something so specific in you tames the stars in me. That's kind of more in line with everything, right? The kind of hyperactive joy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like that, that, that could like shift into this anxious nightmare of feelings I've struggled with my entire life was almost jarringly out of place because it also just it gets followed up with. Um, Catch these hands for anyone who's with my plan. These hands for anyone who tell me this or that. These hands, if the whole world thinks that it's too good for me, catch these hands if you'd like to come and see. So, Catch These Hands is fun. It's maybe the one track that hits the weirdest for me on the album, outside of maybe Birdsong, because some of the sounds can really mess with my head, but it feels like an album closer. Like, it just has this kind of a powerful, broad conclusion to it. The lyrics are the kind of like tongue in cheek, I don't know, empowering reclaiming of a turn of phrase that feels like very good in like a rudimentary way. This isn't like an insult or anything. It just feels a bit like a different musician would have let this be the end of the album outside of one particularly weird moment in it that also sticks with me forever. I don't know, besides that, it fits the bill, right? But but it's not the end of the album. We get Birdsong uh, next, and then the album, like, collapses back into that kind of anxious fear seated in nine stars. Birdsong takes us there. It takes us to the next track, Would You Please Wake Up. Would you please wake up the light of my life I saw you stir To the next one, My Best Friend, which is a morose instrumental piece in the sunset of this album. 
before leaving us with this absolutely devastating finale. Morning, silently hoping that I'll die before the rain. Morning, frozen with worry and dismay. This album, this album, album almost feels like it's fucking with me through time, like that that I could be drawn into its pleasant highs, luxuriating in its kind of like liberated, you know, exuberant energy, only to just crash headlong into this uncompromising raw nerve of pain. I think, I this I I think this couldn't work without the kind of play with the lyrics that it employs. I, I don't think you can tell the story that these two albums tell with a kind of blending of lyrical styles that they each individually display. The, the joyride of Picks and Bit is reflected in the structure of the album itself, and that's that's really good. Like, not everyone, as far as I'm aware, struggles with conversations with other people, so instead, the album teaches you to focus less and less on the words at play and just enjoy the visceral feelings of it, of, of the way the words bounce and play with the glitzy, sparkling accompaniment before it absolutely guts you, because something happened there. You missed something in this album's conversation, you crossed the line, and now the fallout, as much as the desire to push back, to, to defend, to rebuke, the fallout has to happen. And that kind of brings us back to where we began, doesn't it? So what has Patricia Taxon learned in the intervening almost two years between these two pieces? I actually hate that question because it kind of suggests a sort of ranking of the two and I, I, don't, I don't do that. I think they're both fascinating pieces of art, but if we're working with some of these principles we've established, you know, the tweet, the narrative flow of picks and bit, et cetera, et cetera, we can see the, the flowers of Robert Mablethorpe apply these kinds of elements to tell a story that's far less uh, twisty. Uh, look, indulge me a bit. Like, there's a little bit of a hint early on that this isn't just going to be, like, a sexy furry album, right? Like, it's not textual, and maybe I'm just missing it, but there's there's something in the tone of the music that hints that this is a rougher story than we're getting into. Not all the time. It's very selective. I want to say uh, um, about, like, like, look at the way the Texan's voice kind of shakes out into nothing in La Letra. Is anybody having there? Anybody having there? Anybody having there? And it comes up more prominently, the, the feeling that the music is speaking the words that our narrator isn't really giving us here in Beast Creature. You came to me a feast. I came to you a creature. I asked you what it means. Honest me a lever. I don't understand it either. I don't understand it either. But then you called me yours. It felt real. The album knows enough to pull back. Like... Okay, so like the two leading tracks feel almost like showcases, you know, big, bold, sexy statements of the kind of shit we're getting into that can definitively like work to pull the wool over your eyes. But it is really the kind of close touch, intimate nature of Railway that like nails the feeling of being with someone, right? With all this like ominous leading up to it, we get to be here in this feeling, the feeling like the world is standing still and politely looking away while you get to be in love in a way that isn't, that isn't, I don't know, conventional, marketed, uh, pinned down in traditions and symbology. It's just, it's just a raw expression, a moment caught between times. It's terrifying. There's a kind of honesty at play here. The, the feeling that there's no real reason to pull the bait and switch from two years ago because the story is so deeply confessional. Like, the turn itself is something that happened, something inescapably a part of the story that there's no need to sugarcoat it. This is a story about an intimate relationship that meant two different things to the two involved, and the fallout of that realization is heartbreaking. This isn't to pit these two albums to, like against each other by any means. They're just 
conveying different things. Pick, Pix and Bit needed to lure you in, to make you lost in itself, to make the kind of stark panic of hurting someone you love hit the way it does. And in Flowers, you just need to be present with a narrator. You just, you just need to be with her, to, to feel her efforts, to be herself, to be sexual, to be lost in someone, to find this part of herself this part that needed him in a very specific way and for that need to not only be unrequited but maybe even something that pushed him away it's it's rough there's a problem though not um not not with what i was talking about about these albums but with this essay it's taken me months and now this is this is now me coming back from the essay's uh future to what the fuck am I saying? Look, uh, there's a clear hanging thread in all of this, right? Like I was going to try and, you know, wrap things up and make a big deal about, like, feeling things, the emotional resonance of music and how it's not beholden to lyrical clarity or whatever. But I left off the table the actual thing that's gotten under my skin about this is what these albums did to me, the intended result. No, th th that's actually not it either. Um, why am I freaking out? about whether or not there's validity to the specific kinds of feelings I got out of these albums. Like, like, can we not kid ourselves here? Like, I've been in the business long enough. I've heard all the death of the author discourse. These are questions I grappled with in undergrad like a decade ago. So why am I freaking out about this? What about these feelings have me looking for what is becoming increasingly apparent, a way to delegitimize them? The answer, I think, may very well be shame, right? Like, one of these albums made me confront my choice to go to law school and seriously contend with a part of myself that has been floating around in my head for, God, 15 years. This album has made me think about myself in contexts of, like, my relationships, and that despite my own stuff, like, just, uh, despite not being romantic or intimate with people, I also have people in my life who mean more to me than I do to them. And, and, and that regardless of knowing that it's not great to be in a relationship like that, I, I don't want to let them go. <laughs> Ironically, it's a similar feeling I got when I first played Echo, the furry horror visual novel dating sim. It's very good, uh, but also like, don't play it alone in the middle of the night while sad because... Oh, boy. Um, part of that weird question I actually posed up at the top of this essay was grasping with something that is not very conventional. And maybe I've been kind of raised to reject such things. That can't be me. You know, it's silly feeling like my pseudo-furry identity crisis somehow precludes me having a joyless career in public interest law. Like, I can be a furry or whatever the fuck I am and be a normal person. It's fine. Everyone has peculiarities and quirks and weird things, but, you know, the end result is the same. If I know when to shut the fuck up about it and, and, and whatnot, I can be normal. Normal is a term that's rigged up to my neck and dangles perpetually in front of me. An everlasting ephemeral obligation, a constant pursuit. What was not normal as a child, interests I've learned to keep to myself, the months of classes I inexplicably half remember being in that taught things like how to make it look like you're listening to people. Because as it turns out, I was once told by a teacher that it doesn't matter if you're actually lis listening to someone. If you don't actively look like you're listening, people will think you're rude. Worrying still is that often these memories really are hazy. Like, I know they happened in grade school. It must have been grade school, but I, I never thought much about them. I just learned over time that talking to people was something I had to, like, learn how to perform like an actor. You know, granted, it's something I've gotten really good at, but it's manual. Like, like if you had to breathe manually every time, like you can totally do it, but it's just very weird to have to be so conscious of not just what the other person is saying, but that they can see from your responses that you're with them in this. Even if you are and just can't show it, that, that's, that, that's speaking genuinely from the heart 
was something that I could never trust because <laughs> because I swear this all I was a weird kid growing up, but I was taught to present normal, to fake how to talk to people. Not because I don't want to talk to people or that I don't care or that I don't have emotions or anything like that. In fact, I feel things a lot all the time once I figure out what's happening, but because ultimately my own intent is meaningless. <laughs> you know, as the author of my own life, I am dead my body left to the mercy of those who consume me. But even then, I can't dismiss the thrilling joys of these albums, that however brief or ephemeral, no matter the destination of these pieces, both got to be revelatory for me as well, both gave me a thrill of feeling what I honestly have struggled to feel from most spaces. I've never felt like I fit in anywhere always hiding something about myself or so painfully trained to be normal that it's just obvious that I truly am neither here nor there. In, in the cosmic question of if I'm a furry or not, and it almost feels like the answer has to be neither. And Taxon's work in these albums don't feel like, like, I don't know, like building a community for people like me. I'm aware that the two of us are very different in a lot of ways. It, it's not... It's not community, just resonance, I think. A moment where my head got to make sense in glimpses, and even the worst of it, even the parts that made me confront how I was raised, my hazy past, that is the heart of this music. They aren't just an escape, or just a raw confession of pain, but both, together, in harmony. I want to give a shout out to Fresh Till Death, who actually supplied all of the audiovisual essays that you've seen throughout the entire length of the video. I would not have been able to make this video uh, without their contribution. I've linked a bunch of uh, their stuff in the description. Um, thank you so much. This really would not have happened without you. Also, I would like to thank my patrons, specifically Brandon Haney, Caitlin Fisher, Colleen T, Dr. A, uh, the John McCone Foundation for Democratic Engagement in the Americas, Louis Wells, Lo Rez, Maria Aladren, Alistair V, Natalie Lane Baker, Narai the Redmarked, Bahor, Professor Bopper, St. Rawberry, Thomas Wolpez, and Zetetic. Thank you all so much. <laughs>